it's interesting after after sort of 10 years of the Goodman project and doing this thing on the side um, you know now I'm looking you know when I look at law firm culture through the lens of, of that um, I see a lot of that dominance based culture um, hmm. um, and expectations in terms of you know you always have to win you have to be decisive you know you make a decision you're not collaborative you you, know, you do it all you know and especially in in sort of big law, you know, litigation, um, you know, and both men and women are expected to act that way. That, that's sort of part of the mm-hmm. identity in many ways. Welcome back to the Thriving Lawyers podcast. In this week's episode, join Michael Kahn for part one of a discussion with Mike Kasdan about his refreshing approach to lawyering, which includes self-awareness, vulnerability, authenticity, and humane leadership. Welcome back to the Thriving Lawyers podcast. I am Michael Kahn one half of real-time creative learning experiences. My partner is Chris Osborne. He's a practicing lawyer. I am a former lawyer and a now a, have been a psychotherapist since for a long time, let me put it that way, <laughs> since the 90s. Um, we have a great guest. We have always have great guests, so I'm being redundant, but uh, we have Michael Kasdan. He is, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll read you a little bit of his, his bio. Um, he is a lawyer, obviously. He's got his JD from NYU School of Law, also is an adjunct professor there. He is an IP lawyer and currently is partner in, in the IP group at Wigan and Dana. Hope I pronounced that right. You can correct me. Mike, when you come, when when you join me, Michael. Um, and for the last 10 years, he uh, has been in the leadership at the Good Men Project, where, and we'll hear more about that, of course, from Michael Burry. He's, he's been an editor there, worked on the business side, been, um, and running its uh, mental health section. And now he's the director of special projects. And he also um, has run some social media campaigns, which are interesting just in their their names, hashtag not weak, just human, and hashtag we rage for love. Those are intriguing hashtags. We can talk about that later. And then most recently, he has married his interests in mental health advocacy and the legal industry under the umbrella of lawyering while human. And he's also on the communications committee of the Institute for Wellbeing in law. And finally, he lives in Maplewood, New Jersey, where most of my clan lives or lived. My grandparents lived in Maplewood. So I always, that brings up some warm feelings when I hear the name of that town. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on. Yeah, I'm excited about this conversation. Anything in the bio that uh, you want to, I'm sure there's plenty in there we we're going to expand on, but any any holes I left there that you wanted to uh, add to? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I'm glad we have the, the Maplewood commonality. I've lived, uh, <laughs> lived here for a little over 20 years uh, yeah. and uh, uh, with, with a break for a little couple years abroad, but otherwise been in Maplewood and and worked in New York uh, for, uh, you know, in the city for, for most of my time. Uh, except for these past couple of years of pandemic time. But uh, no, in terms of the background, uh, yeah, no, that's great. I'm a practicing lawyer. Uh, I've been at kind of uh, big firms. I started my career at, at Kirkland and Ellis after clerking uh, in the District of Delaware uh, and uh, moved to an IP boutique called Amster Roth and Ebenstein. And then about eight years ago, uh, a few of us from there came over to Wigan and Dana uh, to start their IP litigation and licensing group. Um, and then, like, like you mentioned, I've had this... Uh, this side project, this sort of passion project with the Good Men Project, um, for uh, for quite a while now, uh, used to keep that very separate, uh, kind of very very two separate hats. And uh, the world's changed a little bit. I've changed a little bit. So the past few years, they're kind of merging. Um, and I think you know one of the outcomes of that and some of my own personal experiences uh, led to uh, to me starting this this lawyering lawyering while human project that that you mentioned uh, earlier this year. So I'm uh, I'm really glad to be on. Yeah, and I have to say, I'm going to go off on just a, I have to, a slight tangent here. We both found out in, uh, we've had a couple of conversations, I think, uh, before the uh, podcast. We found out 
I don't think we've talked about it. We just discussed this on email that we're both um, addicted to, or maybe, I don't know if you are, to Severance, the show Severance on, on yeah, Apple. I think, I think I will admit to the addiction, yes. Yes. I was so sad last last week when the, the last the finale came out. I know you're not up to it yet, so I'm not <laughs> going to – no spoilers. Right. But gosh, I was like, I was really sad when I watched it when it when it ended. In fact, I'm starting. I'm watching it over again. Nice. <laughs> I'm now on episode three again because now it's actually kind of cool to watch it now that I know mm-hmm. more of what I learned in the last uh, episode. Now it's kind of cool to go back and see how you can find little uh, hints of yeah, what you see I mean, at the end. It's yeah, it's fun. interesting. I, no, I love that show, and uh, we usually, uh, my, myself and, and my girlfriend that I live with, uh, Lisa, we uh, we usually tend to watch these edgier shows with my teenage uh, daughter, and so that that's kind of one of the shows we watch together. And uh, and yeah, it's interesting because it's it's kind of about the balance or lack there. It is on topic, anyway. isn't it? <laughs> sort yeah. of, yeah. So, so it does hit that, <laughs> and also it's like I feel a little bit how I feel when I started watching Jordan Peele's horror movies. Uh, you know, like knowing him from Key and Peele as this kind of funny guy. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of feel that way about Ben Stiller now. I'm like, wow, mm. um, <laughs> this is yes. a pretty deep, uh, you know, not funny, um, but uh, fascinating kind of look at things. Yeah, Ben Stiller, uh, for, for for the listeners, is um, producing and directing. He's directed most of them. And it does have some, some humor. It's very... Uh, <laughs> I guess how what would you describe it? Uh, um, dark humor. Dark, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it is, yeah, it is the 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 overall theme of it is the idea of of work life balance, and uh, the the I won't go into the show. That's not why we're here today. But I encourage any of you to, um, if you have Apple Plus, to check it out. It's really really well done and and thought provoking. All right, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, Michael, um, so uh, tell me where, gosh, there's so many different directions I'd want to go. I want to, I want to learn about the Good Men Project. I want to learn about Lawyering While Human. Sure. Um, wh- where would you, you, I know you first started working on the Good Men Project, so why don't we start there? What, yeah. what drew you to that? And tell, us, tell us about the Good Men Project. What and what drew you to it, and sure. in that you can share your story, and if you want, as much as your story that that's relevant to to that uh, question. Yeah, no, I'm happy to, and I think the dots do kind of connect between that experience and and uh, and what I'm doing now with Lawyering While Human. I'm still doing uh, diversity and inclusion related stuff with the Goodman Project, and still writing quite a bit. Um, but um, so I, I actually learned about the Goodman Project uh, from from a friend of mine, from actually, who's now my girlfriend, Lisa. Um, she, it was a website she knew about, um, and I didn't. Uh, and when I first uh, actually, and, and we can get into this, but uh, I would say probably when I, when I first experienced depression um, back, uh, which was a, a sort of midlife occurrence for me for the first time, um, at the kind of bottom part of that, um, you know, speak of dark, um, I, uh, I wrote about it. Um, I had, I'd spent a couple of years living in Japan and started writing a blog. I started blogging as a way kind of to keep in touch with family and share things. Uh, it was kind of right at the beginning of when Facebook, I wasn't really on Facebook and that was kind of my way of communicating. And so I really got, kind of got into writing that way. Uh, and so, yeah, after, uh, that happened to me, I kind of wrote about it, about the experience just as a way of, of processing it. Um, and I showed it to a few people that I was friends with and my family. Um, and Lisa said, you know, you really should consider publishing this because there are not a lot of men, there's not, not a lot of people talking about this and there are probably a lot of people having a similar experience. And certainly there aren't men, a lot of men talking about it. Um, and at the time I, you know, my reaction was I couldn't possibly publish this. It would just, you know, clients would see it and the people I work mm-hmm. with would see it. Yeah. Um, but uh, she said, well, maybe they'd publish it anonymously. Um, and she introduced me to uh, a, a, an editor at the time at the Goodman Project named Mark Green. Um, and he actually published it anonymously. 
Um, and and I really kind of enjoyed writing about it and seeing it out there and saw people kind of react to it. And, you know, over time, I got a little braver about it and sort of started writing more about mental health and attaching my name to it. Um, but that was kind of my first my first entree into the Goodman Project was was through the sound of the mental health door, um, you know, which is related to what I'm doing now. Um, but, you know, after that, I met some folks in leadership with the Goodman Project. Um, and the Goodman Project story is pretty interesting. Um, I think, the, I think the, the, the company or the site started in 2009 or 2010. Uh, it was started by a guy named Tom Matlack. Um, and uh, it was actually started uh, as a, uh, to market a book that he wrote called The, the Good Men Book. He was struggling with what it meant to be good, what it meant to be a man. He interviewed a lot of people from different walks of life, old and young, black and white, gay and straight, uh, you know, CEOs, people in prison, um, and sort of to show this this large diversity. Um, and he uh, hired uh, Lisa Hickey, who's now the CEO of the Good Men Project, to uh, market it. And she created a website and Facebook page. And uh, what they found was that, um, what they had on their hands was more of a media site. People came to the website, they had great conversations there, there were articles, um, and that they sort of pivoted to that from the book and it became this media company. Um, so at the time I met Lisa, uh, you know, she was in New York at the time, I was in New York, I had published that one piece. And I was 35, I was coaching my son's Little League baseball team. Um, I had a lot of thoughts about that and how maybe parents were taking it a little bit too seriously. Um, I was playing pickup basketball uh, with a group of guys uh, that was just, you know, not like a high level quality in terms of, you know, we weren't like above the rim or anything like that. But uh, but it was an important part of my life, even though they were just acquaintances to do that and hang out with those men, uh, you know, uh, every Wednesday night. And so I thought like, well, okay, can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can yeah. I interrupt you just for a second? Yeah. What was important about it, about um, uh, having those regular pickup games with with those guys? Yeah, I mean, just connection, um, connection outside of work, uh, you know, friendship. I mean, getting the exercise was great, but, you know, just seeing that same group and you sort of slowly talk over over time on the court or on the sidelines, like, you know, you form, the, I mean, they're loose relationships, but but they're, uh, but they're important. And, uh, and so that, that was, that was a really good outlet for me. I, you know, I was working as a lawyer in the city. I was, I was working long hours and that was, that was really nice. And then I had little kids, you know, trying to be a good dad. And, um, so it was important to kind of have that. And, um, so when I talked with Lisa, I said, you know, I have these couple ideas about sports and she said, well, sports is this kind of great way to meet men, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and talk about those issues. And, she said it was a little under, underdeveloped at the time. She said, we have a couple of people that are running the sports section. If you want to write this one sports piece or write a couple, that's great. It's easy. And I was thinking, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm pretty busy. I'm doing IP litigation. Um, but I'd love, love to write these couple of pieces. And I did. Um, and then, you know, two weeks later, uh, those two guys left and I became the senior sports editor at the Goodman Project. And so I came in kind of mental health and then wrote about sports, but sort of sports and society, sports and culture, uh, talking about a lot of issues through the lens of sports. Yeah. And, and, and it was all, and everything was looked at through a prism of, uh, being a man and men's, the men's perspective. Yeah. So, so the, so yes, uh, the, the neat thing, the thing I like about the Goodman project is, uh, that it's really all about including sort of inclusive vision of masculinity, uh -huh. um, sort of big tent masculinity. Like there's not one way to quote, you know, be a man. Uh, there are certainly societal norms, uh, and, and, you know, stereotypes, but there are a lot of people that sort of fall out of that box, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, there's their sexuality or whether they like sports or, you know, whether right. they're poetic. And um, so, you know, the vision of the Goodman Project is kind of, you know, including that that whole vision of, of, uh, of masculinity, which is pretty interesting issue that I think actually really connects to a lot of issues in society in general, you know, politics and relationships uh, and mental health. So it, well, it's yeah. Conversation. Yeah. If I, if I can go off on a tangent with you. Um, sure. And I know it's. Uh, I, I know it's an old, it's like two or three weeks old now, but uh, you and I talked about it, the whole uh, Academy Awards uh, <laughs> deal, the slap as it's now going to be 
go down yes. as, as yes. you know, you say the slap, you know what they're talking about. Um, cause to me, that was one of the, uh, one of the, and there were so many multifaceted issues that, that, uh, have been discussed around, discussed around it. But one of them was, uh, where does the idea of, or where did the idea of masculinity factor in, in Will Smith's reaction uh, to what Chris Rock said? Yeah. What do you think about yeah. that? Is that, you think that's a relevant uh, issue? I think it's relevant. I mean, I think, look, there's been a lot of ink spilled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on there, but, and, yeah, but, yeah. but I, I think it's relevant here. I think it is. You know, I, I wrote a short article uh, on it like the next day because, uh, you know, looking at these issues uh, at the Goodman Project for so long, to me, it was, you know, he was having this very sort of traditional patriarchal man response where he was tough and he was confrontational and he was violent. Um, and he was also kind of, you know, he was protecting, you know, his wife, almost like his own property. And mm -hmm. all these issues are really difficult intersectional issues. As, as right. Of course. Out, right? There's all yes. these issues about you know, his growing up and his own father and about, you know, if you look at like black culture, like the importance of hair and, yes. you know, you know and, and her, I don't know if you want and, to And, and I've heard, but, you know, yeah. And African-American, I've heard some mm -hmm. uh, like this, I forget which actress, it may have been Tiffany Haddish who said that she, she, um, that she liked that he came to her defense, that uh, an African-American man came to the defense of his his wife, that 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 was something that she appreciated. So yeah, there's a lot. I appreciate the intersectional nature of it for yeah. sure. And, and it's it, not just it's not just men who are uh, very comfortable with that traditional response. So I think like Tiffany Haddish is saying, yeah, like as a woman, like I like these gendered roles. Yeah. I like this yeah. very. I like this kind of patriarchy. It protects me. Yeah. Um, but but one of the big things I learned over a long time and through a lot of conversations, you know, at the Goodman Project is, um, you know, that that this very narrow vision of masculinity, which is, mm. you know, I, I think some people call it toxic masculinity. That tends to be a controversial term. Other people call yeah. it like dominance based masculinity. Um, yeah. But, but if you, if that dominance based masculinity, um, which, you know, the feminist movement, you know, said it, it's harming us in all these ways. Um, you know, it also harms men in a lot mm. of ways because if you fall outside of that box, you're kind of beaten back into the box. Uh -huh. um, and I think it causes a lot of sort of problems that, that, that are, that are male problems more than, you know, which includes, I think, you know, mental health and loneliness. You know, you asked me about why that basketball game was important to me. Uh -huh. um, and if you look at the statistics about, you know, middle-aged men and having like real friendships and loneliness, um, they're not good. Um, no. And I think it also intersects with the very high incidence of, you know, depression and suicide in men. Um, and so I think, like I and said, worse for, and worse for lawyers game. too, don't you think? Worse yeah. for ma male male attorney. I mean, men generally. Yeah, I've seen studies that men are more lonely overall yeah. than yeah. Uh, than women. But I, even to me, maybe even worse so for lawyers. Yeah, and, and when, I look, when I look at yeah, it's interesting after after sort of ten years of the Goodman Project and doing this thing on the side. Um, you know, now I'm looking. You know, when I look at law firm culture through the lens of of that. Um, I see a lot of that dominance based culture um, hmm. um, and expectations in terms of, you know, you always have to win. You have to be decisive. You know, you make a decision. You're not collaborative. You you, know, you do it, all, you know, and especially in in sort of big law, you know, litigation, um, you know, and both men and women are expected to act that way. That That's sort of part of mm -hmm. the identity in many ways. Um, yeah, not just men. It's the yeah, culture. No, no. And, yeah, right. and so I see those, female lawyers, too. Yeah. And I see that. I, I see that very clearly i think and i think there are a lot of parallels mm -hmm. yeah and that that's important because that's some of the changes that are happening now um and we mentioned the uh, well-being well-being week in the law that and then the uh, the aba uh institute on well-being i i, I think I, f I forget if that's the current name or the old name but they they put out that report about what three years ago yeah. On um, focusing on thriving in the law and some of the changes that need to happen in the culture. Um, yeah. So, so does, 
does you're moving on to the loring while human is that is that where that's directed is tell me more about that and what yeah, that's, I mean, a, in lar- what in that's large about part, in large part it is um but i think it intersects a lot of different things including um you know authentic leadership and diversity and inclusion but it is really focused on on mental health and wellness and um and yeah that comes that's largely informed by my own experience as a lawyer uh, dealing with this periodic um, but very acute depression uh, mm. that started uh, when I first, you know, you know, it started back in 2010, 2011. Um, but, you know, it's happened to me a, a, a number of times over the years. Um, what's, if you don't mind me asking, Michael, what's what's helped you in that regard? As I as I as you know, I'm a therapist mm-hmm. and um, I, I'd be curious to know what's helped you the most in dealing with your depression the the as yeah. you say it's come up mm-hmm. various times in your life what's helped you the most what kind of things yeah so i think you know in the beginning what helped me the most was figuring out why not that there's always not that there's one simple answer of course you know many factors but um you know in the beginning um you know i was really stressed at work and i you know i was a new partner and uh I feel like maybe young partners don't, uh, you know, we get there, their expectations, mm-hmm. you don't really know what you're doing on the business side because you have to kind of mm-hmm. learn that. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're in charge of a big case for the first time and, uh, and it's difficult and adversarial. Um, but also, you know, I thought I was just stressed at work. Um, but there were also issues, you know, in my, in my personal life, uh, you know, issues in my marriage that I wasn't confronting and dealing with. Um, issues that, you know, that I had sort of been not great at in terms of, uh, you know, I'm a big people pleaser. Uh, I was not really good at, at boundaries or saying no, not good at confronting things. You know, if I wasn't mm-hmm. able to figure something out or I was struggling with something, I would yeah. not say, Hey, can you, can someone help me with this? I would just sort of sit on it. Uh, and it gets worse. And so I think, so the first thing I think that really helped me was seeing a therapist that like helped me to figure out kind of some of these root causes. Um, cause that was really enlightening. That was almost like, de- it was like detective work, right? Well, helped um, you identify those things you just said. Yeah. That's how the therapy helped, helped you identify yes. the fact that you put your needs behind everybody, um, or uh, behind, yeah, everybody yeah. else's mm-hmm. needs, not saying no, um, you know, isolating yourself, probably not, not, right. showing, not, not being vulnerable, not asking yeah. for help, all that. So th- that was the first thing, but, but then, you know, over time, you know, uh, when, when I would have a, a recurrence of depression, um, you know, which happens, I do feel like each time I've emerged from it, I kind of know myself better and I am a little hmm. bit more resilient. Uh, so even though it's a little frustrating, like you yeah. know, this last, the, the last time, I mean, you know, skipping ahead or skipping back, you know, sure. what, what led to me starting learning while human uh, was, you know, during the last year, um, you know, uh, with COVID at its height and being isolated. And, uh, you know, I had a pretty long period of, of really acute depression um, for a number, you know, of reasons, again, sort of combination of work and, and home stresses and, and COVID and sort of the state of the world and some relationship stuff. Um, and, you know, it all combined in this kind of perfect storm. And, and even though I, I saw it kind of coming, um, I didn't, I wasn't really able to avoid it, uh, which was that that part was a little frustrating because I I thought, oh, I wish I were more resilient. So but but, you know, and, and I did take some time off from work this time. Um, I actually took quite a long period off from work, uh, which was its own, uh, you know, stressful and, and, and concerning experience. Um, but, you know, while I was out, I saw but a lot that of was but that was things. different than you would have done earlier, though. Right. You would have tried yeah. to just power through, quote unquote, soldier on power yeah. through. And in yeah. this case, you realized I need to take care of myself. Yeah. And in terms of what mm-hmm. helped, you know, I, I did um, for the first time in my life go to group therapy um, uh-huh. and okay. uh, and did some, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and, and DBT and, and started really working with mindfulness and techniques. Was it a mixed gender group or just men? Mixed, mixed gender group, uh-huh. uh, mixed, mixed age group with a very, very mm-hmm. wide range. Mm-hmm. Um, and Um, you know, I always, I learned a little bit about mindfulness in the past and I kind of rejected it thinking I'm a multitasker. I move too fast for that. It's kind of (laughs) Eastern weird stuff. And, um, but now, I mean, like even like breath work, um, mindfulness, taking time in my day, those are really important things 
that I learned, you know, actually understanding what's happening in my brain, rec- recognizing when I'm judging myself. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, that was kind of the next step that really helped me. Um, and it took a while and I'm not, you know, I'm not great at it yet, but it's, it's, but that, that's a part of my life and, and group therapy continues to be a part of my life. There's a, a group I found called the lawyers depression project. Um, okay. They meet online, a uh, n- number of groups every week. Um, they have a webpage and uh, what's their website, and, you know, off the top of your um, and I, I think it's that's right. They can Google it. Lawyers depression yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah. They'll find it okay. on Google, but uh Okay. And they, they offer multiple sessions uh, kind of at the same time uh, during the month and during the week. And uh, I almost religiously go to this one time during the week. And, and that that's nice because it's other lawyers and, you know, some people are up, some people are down. You kind of see the same people. Uh, it's almost like that basketball game um, with, with, of course, less basketball um, or talking. But, uh, yeah. but it's a really useful part yeah. of my life. And I think, you know, one thing I used to do, and I actually made this mistake um, – even when I was out last, when I was out last year, um, I, I did a, an intensive outpatient, outpatient program um, for six weeks, and then I kind of didn't know what to do with myself, and I was stressed about missing time, and I was like, "All right, I guess I'm gonna, you know, go back." And I went back, um, and uh, and it did not work. Like I, I, I was still not in a good frame of mind, and I, I had to take more time off, which was frustrating. But I realized one thing I did um, was. During that IOP program, I had learned all these techniques that I that were really helping. You know, I was like breathing in the morning. I was getting exercise first thing before checking my phone. Um, I was I was doing some mindfulness stuff. I was doing like chair yoga that was helpful. Like all these things I would have never thought that I would do. But then when I got back to work, my brain was like, "Okay, you're working now. You, can, you don't have the time to do that." And also, like, "Wow, Mike, you missed a lot of time. You better just put your nose down and work. You don't have time to go take a walk. You don't have time to do chair yoga." And I made right. the mistake of like not integrating those things into my life, and yes. I slipped like right back down. So now I'm I'm really intentional about it. And you know, yeah, you know, I not, yeah, uh, yeah, I talk to lawyers um, about that. My clients, I'm sure that. Um, and some are good at doing things in the morning, like like you say, doing mm-hmm. breathing exercises or meditation or exercise mm-hmm. or, or you know running, yeah. walking, things like that. But during the work day, they don't do anything. Yeah, it's there's a long no time. time, no no time to replenish at all. Yeah. In fact, I had a client yesterday. This is really interesting. And a uh, lawyer, young lawyer, a very young, an associate, not a partner. And I talked to him about, uh, I asked him, what do you do to replenish throughout your day? And, and he said, I didn't do anything. So I said, well, I don't have time. I said, well, this, yeah. what I'm suggesting doesn't have to take a lot of time. Like, for example, look away from your screen. Just look out the window for a couple minutes. Um, I know. And, and when then I was come younger, back and do your work. Yeah. And then, but listen, yeah. listen to though his response, uh, Mike. He said, Oh, I don't. I can't do that. I don't have time for that. If a partner yeah. saw me looking out the window, that wouldn't be good. Yeah. So well, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's an uphill battle against like certain aspects of the culture that I think need to change. But you know, I think the billable hour creates certainly within yes. me. You're, you're thinking like, well, this is just less time that I'm billing, and then how many? How much am I billing? Um, but I, I, I think, and, and like I, I was going to interrupt you and say, um, when I was younger, if someone my age said you know, look out the window <laughs> or, you know, take a break sure. or breathe or do chair yoga. I would have been like, this guy has Screw you. What he's talking Screw about, you know, um, but I do. That's a good point. But people work <laughs> differently. Um, yeah. Like I realized this has always been true about me. Like I'm a pretty like bursty worker. Like my brain actually works better for like short bursts with a lot of uh-huh. breaks. Um, and I can like, I can write stuff and do stuff. Re- and so I, I think it actually works positively to like make sure that if I'm in one of those in between periods that I'm not just sitting in front of the computer that I'm trying to do something that's you know you know more more sort of healthful or or, or take an actual break and it, and it, it's not it's it's really not I think that's the uphill battle that we have to fight with young people and I think that I hope that we can do this in law schools there are law schools that are starting to do this to realize that when we're talking about mindfulness you know we're not talking about you know some zen guy crossing his legs and and chanting how, how would you, you know, define it for for I mean, young for well, young well, associate think, what's mindfulness 
That concludes part one of our discussion with Mike Kasdan. Look for our next episode to hear the rest of the interview. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Thriving Lawyers podcast. We love hearing from our loyal listeners, so please feel free to email us any questions, comments, suggested topics, or guest recommendations at the following address, feedback at thrivinglawyerspodcast.com. The Thriving Lawyers podcast is brought to you by Real-Time Creative Learning Experiences, a national provider of continuing legal education and professional development programs that leave participants engaged, encouraged, and equipped to pursue meaningful and sustainable change in their practices, their lives, and the organizations they work in. And by Osborne Conflict Resolution, your experienced guides through the uncharted terrain of business and family law disputes based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Thriving Lawyers Podcast. Thank you.